Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm powerless over alcohol. My name is Dave and I am a recovered alcohol. I've recovered from a hopeless state of mind and body. You'll hear that over and over and over again um, as we go through this weekend because one of the things that I'm, I'm after is a better relationship with God, and the byproduct of that is I don't have a mental obsession, and if I don't have a mental obsession, I don't pick up a drink, and I can't have a physical craving if I don't drink. It's a wonderful thing. For those of you guys who weren't here yesterday, uh, we're drinking from a fire hose. Last night we covered with steps one, two, and three. And I'll give you the Reader's Digest version on that. Uh, there's Everybody's got a booklet. The booklet's all your notes you're going to need. It's 42 pages, I think it is, of notes. So you guys don't have to sit here and scribble. You can pay attention to what's going on. Everything is referenced. Like I spoke, told you guys yesterday, I use the study edition of the big book, which has the paragraphs numbered. So when you see a page number and a colon, the number after the colon is the paragraph. So 16 colon 3 is page 16, and it's the third full paragraph down the page. So it kind of zeroes you in to find where the quote comes from. What I was taught was don't ever let anybody read your big book for you. That's one of the reasons I put it in there. If it's a colon 0, it's a part of a paragraph that carried over from the previous page, you know, the few extra lines at the top of the page. So that way you'll understand where those numbers come from and, and help you uh, dig through this stuff. The... Uh, for step one, we talked about there's a threefold illness, body, mind, and spirit. The body is the physical craving, and we, we covered that last night. The mind is the mental obsession, and there's, a, there's a, a mental state that precedes the first drink. And we don't talk enough about the mental state that precedes the first drink. And the mental state comes from a spiritual malady. So the beginning of a relapse starts with spiritual malady. So that morning when you get in an argument with your wife, and you say, ah, I'll say, I'll apologize to her tonight. And you walk out the door. We don't think my relapse just began because I've now started the spiritual malady. How long before I relapse? We don't know. But it can get worse and worse and worse until the mental obsession comes back. And once the mental obsession comes back, as we all know, it's a very short order before we're drinking. Then we went on to step two. We talked about on step two <clears throat> how the, the paragraph from... Uh, 53.2, God is everything or God is nothing. If God is everything, we have to give God everything. If God is nothing, then why are we here? Um, so we covered that pretty well. Uh, then we talked about step three and how step three is not turning our will and our life over to the care of God. Step three is about making a decision about the kind of relationship we're going to have with God, that God is going to be our director. He's going to tell us what to do, that he's the principal, we are his agents, that we're going to let, uh, we're going to be his representative here on this physical plane that God's going to be pointing us when we're going to be basically the expression these days all the kids use is uh, they call each other as a slang, as a d disgrace, as they say, oh, you're just a tool. Well, you know what? Today I am a tool. I'm a tool for God. I'm a channel through which God can flow. All right? And then the last piece is the, the toughest piece of the third step because a lot of us have, have had poor relationships with our fathers, but the last piece of the decision is that we're going to have a father-son relationship. He's the father, we are his children. And that means he's going to love us unconditionally. If we keep close to him and do his work well, he's going to provide everything we need. And if we get off offline, if we get out of out of the spiritual path, he's going to lovingly correct us back. You know, And we create our own misery. And at a certain point, you get the gift of desperation and you come back onto the spiritual path. So <clears throat> that's kind of the Reader's Digest version of where we got to. So following that, that sequence... We're going to start talking about step four today. <clears throat> and uh, step four is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, I've heard just about everything under the sun when it comes to step four. If you look at our book, there's five inventories that we're given for, for the fourth step. And a lot of guys aren't familiar with that, but we're going to cover it right out of the book. All right? <clears throat> we're all familiar with the resentment inventory. That leads us from the resentment inventory into the fear inventory. Then there's a sex inventory. From the sex inventory, we're supposed to write a sex ideal. Most people have never even heard of the ideal. I think it's only mentioned nine times or something in the book, and they don't know, nobody ever bothers to deal with that. It's an important piece of the inventory process. And then there's the catch-all line at the very end. 
if I wasn't angry with the person, so I didn't have a resentment, I wasn't afraid of them, and I didn't have sex with them, but I still harmed them, where do they go? And there's a harms done to others inventory at the very end. There's one sentence. So if you've created a harm, you don't know where it goes on the inventory, that's the catch-all inventory that picks them all up. So there's five pieces to the fourth step. In the guide, I get questions all the time <clears throat> on, on what do I do. The last page is an instruction sheet. When I start working with somebody, typically these days, newcomers are scared of me. I don't know what it is, but most of them, when they find out, I hate to tell people how much sobriety I have, you know, because I'll start working with somebody and they always want to say, well, how long have you been around? And if you remember when you first got sober, you know, if somebody had, you know, two weeks, you're like, I, I believe that. That guy's got two weeks. But if somebody said, I got five years, you thought, that guy's a liar. Nobody can stay sober for five years. You know, and all the old timers that had the multiple di double digits, they were out to lunch. And plus, they scared the hell out of you. At least they scared the hell out of me. So you avoided them like the plague. So when I work with newcomers, I don't like to let them know how much sobriety I have right off the bat, you know, because I want to be able to identify, start talking to them in their language about what it was like when I was out there drinking. And once we have that bond, then we'll move on from there. I tend these days to get a lot of people that have had sobriety for quite some time and they've gotten stale. They're just not firing on all cylinders. They don't know what to do about it. And they'll swing by and kind of go, hey, you know, I've been sober for 15 years, but something's not right. Would you kind of take me through the work? So what I did was I created a sheet like this because alcoholics typically get alcoholic amnesia. You give them a set of instructions, say, hey, this is what I want you to do before we see each other next time is do this, this, and this, and they'll come back with maybe one of the three items done. So I put this thing together, <laughs> and it's just a real quick list of, of the things that I do. I automatically start people on prayer and meditation. If you go back to look at our history with Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob, they started their new guys one day into the program, and they had them on their knees praying and meditating to get that started because our, grant, our, our release is a daily reprieve based on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. So let's plug the guy in as quick as we can into God, all right? Then uh, I, the, the second item on there is what I call the Bill Wilson exercise. It comes from two lines in the book where it talks about if you're alcoholic of our type. And one day it hit me, am I an alcoholic of Bill Wilson's type? So I go through the first eight pages of Bill's story with one color highlighter, and you highlight everywhere you thought, felt, acted, or drank like Bill Wilson, because that's my identification. If I did those behaviors, that means I'm like Bill Wilson. Eight to page 16, you change highlighter colors, and you highlight anything that Bill Wilson did that you are not willing to do, because if there's something that he did that you're not willing to do, that's what's going to kill you. You know, if you look at Dr. Bob's story, Dr. Bob had been practicing the Oxford group six steps for almost two and a half years before he met Bill Wilson. He knew about the Oxford group. He was going to prayer meetings with his wife. He had that piece of it. What he didn't have was the understanding of the craving that came from Dr. Silkworth, right? And Bill came there and he gave him that piece and he was blown away. Here's a doctor who's getting medical information basically about how alcohol affects the human body from this layman stockbroker. And it was a revelation to him. And he says, wow, this is great. I think we're going to stay sober. He says, I'll do everything. But he had one reservation. He wasn't willing to go tell all of his patients and make amends to all of his patients because he'd lost so many of them. He and Ann were just barely getting by. And he had a couple kids to feed, and he was afraid. He had a financial insecurity. So he told Bill, I'll do anything you ask me to do, but I'm not going to tell everybody. And, of course, then the famous thing, he got on the train to go to Atlantic City for the medical convention, and he got shit-faced. You know, and uh, the train conductor kicked him off the train a couple of stations before he got to, got home, and somebody recognized him and called up Ann, and Bill was there and went and picked him up. And after that incident, Dr. Bob says, you know what, I'm done. Whatever it takes. If I have to go tell everybody I'm an alcoholic, I don't care. I'm willing to do anything. When he had no reservations, he stayed sober for the rest of his life. Reservations are a huge component to make sure if you have reservations, they need to be brought into the sunlight of the spirit. We need to take a look at it and talk about it. All right. And the rest of the instructions are, are pretty self-explanatory. I'm not going to spend the time to, to go over them, but that's what those are there for. Just sort of a, a checklist. I'm a pilot. At least I was a pilot. So I, I like checklists. We like that sort of stuff. All right. Uh, also in the guide, people ask me what I use for inventories. Um, the inventory sheets that I use are, are sprinkled throughout the guide. <clears throat> the sex inventory is on page 34. The uh, fear inventory I use is on page 36. The uh, What I call the short form of resentment is on page 40. So everybody go to page 40 in the guide.
Yes, they're on those on the guides. <clears throat> Sorry, is it, everybody found page 40 of the study guide? And you'll notice that column one, it says person, institution, or principle. If you go to 64 in your big book, you'll see where this comes from. I just want to show you where, how I came up with this particular format. On 64, it says resentment is the number one defender. I'm reading from 64 colon 3, by the way. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. From it stem all forms of spiritual disease. For we've been not only mentally and physically ill, we've been spiritually sick. When the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. When dealing with resentments, we set them on paper. So all of the inventories out of the big book are written inventories. Every single one of them talks about it being in writing. So when you go working with a newcomer and he says, oh, yeah, I did my inventory. I got it all up here. Uh uh-uh. The reason is the problem centers in the mind. We read that from 23 colon 1, right, last night. If the problem centers in the mind and it's broken, you can't solve the problem with the problem. And this is Dave's interpretation. It's not big book. But from my experience, when the thoughts leave your mind, when you go to write them out, they have to go through your heart and out your arm. The things that are in my mind, when I bother to write them out, what comes out on the pen, onto the piece of paper, I, I always talk about it, how there's magic of pen and paper. It seems to be a lot of times there's lies and co-signing and manipulations and half-truths in my mind, but when it actually comes writing out on paper, it's the truth. Very often it's just spot on the truth, and I kind of read it and I go, wow, I wrote that? It's not what I was thinking. So it's really important to have a written inventory. <clears throat> All right. In dealing with resentments, we set them on paper. We listed the people, institutions, or principles with whom we were angry. Period. Stop. There's column one. Look at the top of column one. Person, institution, or principle. That's where I got it from. All right. Then we continue. It says, we asked ourselves why we were angry. Column two. It says, why are you angry? All right. There's two things on this sheet that are from, the, from me, not out of the big book. And it's my experience where it says, be very specific and it must be the truth. All right. The reason it needs to be specific is because column three is based off what's in column two. Column four is based off of column three, which is based in column two. If you have something that's not specific and it's not the truth in column two, then all column three is crap and all of column four is crap. So it's logical to make sure. What am I talking about? On one of my inventories, I had my father was column one, and in column two I wrote, always beat me. And I, I brought that to a guy, and he said, he always beats you, so your father's in prison. Mm, no. Well, then he didn't always beat you, you know. The reality of it was six times that I could remember when my father gave me an ass whooping as a kid growing up. But in my mind, I was embellishing, and I know I'm probably the only alcoholic in the room that would ever embellish, <clears throat> you know. So the specific truth is, the, the correct response is when my father beat me or the six times my father beat me. That's good enough for column two. Does that make sense? All right. I call it the mushroom theory because alcoholics are masters at taking a piece of truth, covering it over with a whole bunch of crap, and, and then because there's a, a segment of truth in there, it seems plausible. Now, we're getting down to the causes and conditions. We want to get down to the specifics of what's causing the problem and, and go forward from there. <clears throat> All right. So as we continue, it says, in most cases, we found self-esteem, our pocketbooks, our ambition, our personal relationships, including sex, were hurt, uh, were hurt or threatened. So we were uh, sore. We were burned up. On our grudge list, we set opposite each name, our injuries, what was it, our self-esteem, our security, our ambitions, our personal relations, our sex relations, which have been interfered with. There are six areas that we just covered there in those, in those two paragraphs. If you'll go into the right-hand column all the way down to the bottom, there's pride. That's where the seventh area of self that can be affected is. And if you'll notice in, on column three on the worksheet, I got self-esteem, pocketbook, ambition, personal relations, sex relations, security, and pride right out of the book. All right? Everybody with me? All right. Notice the next line on the page of the big book. We went back through our lives. Nothing counted but thoroughness and honesty. Do you think Bill Wilson meant that? That nothing counts but thoroughness and honesty? Yeah, I think he chose his words very carefully. All right? And then he goes on on page 66, giving us the penalties for not being thoroughness and honest. If you go on 66 colon 1, about right in the dead center of the page, it says, we found it is fatal. For in harboring such feelings, we shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the Spirit. These resentments will block us off from God. And God is our only antidote to the spiritual malady 
which leads to the mental obsession, which leads to the drinking. So this is pretty important. That's why resentment is the number one offender, and it destroys more alcoholics than anything else. All right? And what happens when you shut yourselves off to the, to the sunlight of the Spirit? He tells us, the insanity of alcohol returns when we drink again. With us to drink is to die. If we were to live, we had to be free of anger. Had to. People you know, around the rooms where I go to meetings, sometimes you'll hear, there are no musts in AA. My book is full of musts, nevers, have-tos. Right? It's just they're all over the place. Um, we turn back to the list for it was the key to our future. Do you think that makes it important? It's the key to our future. He's not mincing words here. This is life and death for us as recovered people. Right? <clears throat> Down at the very last paragraph on the page, this was our course. We realized the people who, were, who wronged us were perhaps spiritually sick. Though we did not like their symptoms or the way they disturbed us, we did not like their symptoms. That's what's in column two, right? Their symptom, what they did to us. The way they disturbed us is what's in column three, right? They, like ourselves, were sick, sick too. We asked God. Here's a prayer. Remember I said last night, anytime you see at, we asked, they're talking about prayer, all right? This next paragraph, there's 12 components to the prayer that we're supposed to be asking, and I'll go through them with you. If you go to... Dun, dun, dun. Got to find the correct page for you. If you go to page 10 in the, in the guide... Oops. I've got the 12 components right there at the bottom of the page, on, on page 10. All right? And we're, here's where they come from, in the, from page 67. And you guys go, you follow in the guide, and I'll read to you out of the big book so you can make sure I'm telling the truth. All right? We ask God to help us show them the same tolerance, pity, and patience that we would cheerfully grant a sick friend. When a person offended, we said to ourselves, this is a sick man. How can I be helpful to him? God save me from being angry. Thy will be done. We avoid retaliation or argument. We wouldn't treat sick people that way. If we do, we destroy our chances of being helpful. We cannot be helpful to all people, but at least God will show us how to take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one of them. There's the 12 components. That's where they come from out of that paragraph. All right. You'll notice that number one is tolerance and number 12 is tolerant view. What's the difference? Tolerance is the expression I like to use that everybody seems to identify is, you ever have one of those friends who, God love them, you, they're, they're a good friend of yours, but they got the terrible habit that they're a nose picker? And they're standing there talking to them, they're always picking at their nose? Well, they're your friends. You put up with the behavior. You tolerate the behavior. You don't like the behavior. You don't condone the behavior, but you tolerate the behavior. All right? But when I think of that friend, where my mind goes to is I think of, oh, Joe. Well, yeah, Joe's the nose picker. My mind goes to his, his fault. Having the tolerant view is to think of him instead of as a nose picker, think of him as a child of God who's broken the same way that I'm broken. So tolerance is the behavior. View is how I see him, changing my point of view of how I see this person that I'm, I'm resentful at. Does that make sense? Not easy, you know. But once again, it's a written, you write out this prayer. You know, when you write it out, it makes a difference. With the guys that I work with, we're dealing with resentment. Resentment comes from the, from the Latin, uh, resentare. It means to re-feel. There's an emotional charge underneath this thought. So anytime our mind goes back and we touch this thought, we get this emotional charge, and it relives. It comes to life again. The, the offense, the harm that we've perceived comes back to life. When I'm writing out this prayer, you'll be amazed to watch as you go through it. If it's heartfelt and you're really thinking about it when you're writing it out, you'll notice by the time you get done writing the prayer, the emotional charge is gone. It's, it's inert. It's almost like the event happened to a third person, to somebody else. And you read this prayer and you're like, wow. If it's not completely gone, sometimes you'll have to say the prayer a couple times, you know, take it into your morning meditation. I guarantee you within a week of saying that prayer, it's gone. The emotional charge is gone. If the emotional charge is not gone by the time you're done with this, it's because there's still another resentment. It's not this resentment that you wrote the prayer about. It's some other resentment. You need to go do a fear hunt and figure out what other resentments do you have against this person. I've never seen it not work. It works every single time. Once the emotional charge is gone, then we can take a look at our side of the street. Because when we still have the emotional charge, in most relationships, they've hurt you, but you've hurt them. 
And now we're going to go try to take a look at our side of the street, and we're going to kind of soften our culpability, our issues that we did to them because they did what they did to us. You know, if that's still alive, and we're, we're still willing to kind of look at that and say, well, yeah, <clears throat> classic example. I was working with a guy. He uh, moved in with a girl. They didn't get married. They were living together. <clears throat> and she had this car, and she asked him, hey, would you get down to the DMV and register my car for me? And he said, she, of course, he says, sure, no, not a problem. He goes down to DMV, and he registers the She'd signed the title. He registers the car in his name, right? So when it comes time for the breakup, He's got the title for his car, which he had been driving. In his mind, it's his car, so he takes off with the car. And so I'm hearing his fifth step, and we're going through this process, and I said, oh, so you, you owe her for the car. He says, no, that was my car. And besides, she did this, and she did this, and she did this, and he went through all this list, the emotional charge of what she had done to him. In his mind, he was justifying stealing her car. And I said, no, 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 no. We need to go get rid of get rid of this piece over here. Give her the forgiveness for everything she's ever done, and then we'll take a look at your side of the street. And he wrote out the prayer, and he looked at it, and he went, oh, crap. And then, of course, what did he say? He says, I don't have 8,000 bucks to give her. <laughs> that was his next thing. He was looking at the amend. He said, no, no, we're on a fifth step. We're not on amends. So we're not on nine yet. <laughs> All right? <clears throat> yeah, nice try. Exactly. All right? So this forgiveness piece is huge. In my mind, the whole purpose for the, for the resentment inventory is forgiveness. If you miss the forgiveness, if you get done with the resentment inventory and you still got the emotional charge, why'd you go through the process? Because you'll go through and you'll fifth step and then you'll get down to make the amends and your amends are going to be half-assed because you're still pissed off. You're still carrying the burden, the emotional burden that you had when you started the process. We're supposed to get down to causes and conditions and then it says we're, we're doing this to face and be rid of. We're supposed to look at this stuff and get rid of it, not play with it, not psychobabble it. We're going to look at it and get rid of this stuff, get it out of our lives because it's blocking us off from God. It's keeping us in the shadows when we want to be in the sunlight of the Spirit. Really important stuff. <clears throat> All right? <clears throat> so in my mind, step four is focused on, <clears throat> the, on the inventory to remove the, the harm, the emotional charge that we have so that we can truly find forgiveness in our heart. Let's see if it's going to work today. Did we, did we freeze already? Coffee? Did we get coffee on it? Let's see. Is it going to, no, it's, it's there. Let's try that again. Maybe the switch isn't on. Operator error. All right. It's the unfor unforgiveness that's keeping us in spiritual chains. All right. <clears throat> Until we get, fully get rid of, of the emotional charge, you're not going to be able to fully participate in, in the column four of the inventory process. Because what I just talked about, we minimize our side of the street because of the harm that they did to us. It's not about that. As a matter of fact, on that little sheet, when I go through that fourth column inventory sheet, I'd have the guy have a blank piece of paper. And when we start looking at column four, you take that blank piece of paper and you cover over columns one, two, and three so you can't even see it because it doesn't exist. We're looking at our side of the street when we answer those four questions. Where was I selfish, still seeking, dishonest, and afraid? <clears throat> Fear is the issue. Column four, question four, when we get to that part, is where was I frightened? Those fears are the fears that are connected to resentment, and that becomes the basis for our fear inventory that we're going to get to as our second inventory in the four-step process. <clears throat> Five emotional facts of life that you need to understand if you're going to ever find forgiveness. <clears throat> Number one, life hurts. Because life hurts, we medicate in one form or another. That's one of the reasons we probably started drinking, because life hurt, you know? <clears throat> Did anybody ever in here drink so they could do something? <laughs> I didn't think so. It must just be me. <laughs> All right? <clears throat> Number two, if you, unless you deal properly with the hurt, it accumulates. It builds up in your heart. I call it spiritual plaque. All right? Time doesn't heal all wounds. As a matter of fact, it's the exact opposite. If you don't deal with the wound, it festers and it gets worse. You get, you get sicker and sicker and sicker, right? Uh, <clears throat> the incident's in the past. It doesn't exist anymore. Yet we keep it alive through resentment. You know, I had a woman, I was doing a workshop in New York, and she got really upset, got right, she got on the microphone, and she's like, I got raped, and how could that ever be my side of the street? How could I look at my part in it? And I said, well, when did you get raped? And it was like 15 years earlier. And I said, you know, that's horrible. It's abhorrent. I'm terribly sorry that that happened to you. But it's 15 years ago. You've been keeping it alive for the last 15 years. 
And on the next break, she came to me and she was just weeping. She never realized that she was continuing to rape herself with the, by dragging that memory up almost every, on a daily basis. And I hooked her up with a couple of women, and by the end of that retreat, she was free. She'd gotten rid of, of that resentment. And she'd been in chains for 15 years emotionally. <clears throat> Cumulative pain compromises mental health, emotional, relational, and spiritual health. It just affects every area of your life. You know, I call it a game of spiritual whack-a-mole. You know, you ever see that game where the little moles pop up and you smack them with a the padded hammer and then they pop over there and you smack them down? I guarantee if you, if anybody's in, in a relationship or married and you get into a fight, it's not about the, whatever the topic was that you were fighting about. That's why two years later, you know you had this knockdown, drag out fight and you, your wife will look at you and she'll say, remember that fight we had two years ago? And I guarantee you, every guy will go, huh? <laughs> and I guarantee you, with, without missing a word, they'll tell you word for word. They're wired different than we are. They know exactly what that fight was about because <clears throat> it affected their mental, emotional, relational, spiritual health. And we'll talk about why that is in one of the later sessions. All right? We deal with our pain in some way, right or wrong. Your choice is either forgiveness or the big book gives us two, two choices. Live spiritually or die the alcoholic death. And the worst alcoholic death that I know of is continuing in the sickness and not actually physically dying, to suffer in sobriety. It's one thing to suffer when you're drinking. You can medicate that and make the pain go away temporarily for a little while. But in sobriety, that's why I almost blew my head off at 11 years, was because I was in this terrible emotional pain that I wasn't dealing with. So I'm cleaning my service weapon with a round in the chamber, and I know there's a round in the chamber. I was thinking, you know, it looked like I was cleaning my gun, and, you know, I didn't even have the guts to blow my head off at that point. That's when I turned the corner and came back and said, you know what, I'm going to start doing what I was taught to do. <clears throat> Wanting the offender to know how much hurt is futile. Isn't it amazing how we want grace for ourselves, but we want justice for them? <laughs> you know? <clears throat> the only way to, to heal the hurt is to resolve it and to turn to God with it. That's the only thing that I've ever found. Alcoholics Anonymous is like the recipe for a cake. There's 12 steps, and you have to add the ingredients. They have to be added in the right order. And when it comes out of the baking process, you have a wonderful treat, all right? You ever try to cook and bake something and make a cake and forget the eggs? You get something that comes out, but I guarantee you it's not cake. It's the same thing here. The only way I know is to put the correct order of the recipe into the spiritual oven. God makes the cake. And let me tell you, there's nothing sweeter than when you get a piece of God's cake. <clears throat> Guilt and shame are dissolved by God's forgiveness and His compassion. That's the only way that I can describe it. And putting words to this doesn't do it justice. What I'm describing with words is failing. I'm describing an experience. If you have anybody that's ever gone through this, if you've done it yourself, you know what I'm talking about. You know, it's If you've never smelt a rose, and I say, well, it smells like a rose, you'd have no idea what I'm talking about. But once you've smelled a rose... All I have to do is say it smells like a rose. You know exactly because you had that experience. That's what the forgiveness is about. Once you've had it, it can become an addiction because it's just you get this spiritual peace. And you're like, wow, what is that? That stuff is awesome. Give me more of that. You know, because if one is good in an alcoholic's mind, more has got to be better, right? <clears throat> forgiveness comes from the word in uh, uh, Ephesus. It's, it's Greek. And it literally means to let go of. There's a great talk. You can pick it up over here. Uh, you got probably have it on tape here on, for sale. It's a talk called Drop the Rock. <clears throat> Wonderful talk on, on this. Um, literally, we're holding on to it so tight. That woman who had been raped, she was holding on to that, and her identity was attached to the victim of I was raped. By the end of that workshop, she no longer identified her as a rape victim. She had started to identify her as a survivor who was free. What a shift. And it just took a little bit of time with some people that had some spiritual uh, license with her to be able to say, hey, let's talk this thing through. Let me help you with this. And she walked out a free person. <clears throat> how, how do we do this thing? Awareness. First part of any problem, how do you know what you don't know? Until you know their problem exists and there's a solution for it, you can't start to solve the problem. All of us, most of us should certainly. At some point, everybody else around us could see we had a drinking problem, but we couldn't see it. You know, and then there was enough evidence towards the end that, yeah, we realized it too, but we just didn't want to look at it, right? <clears throat> Recognize the harm is in the past. It's gone. It's the ego that's keeping it alive. It's your mind, right? 
Our judgment and memories of the past are causing the pain, not the offender. What they did to us was way back when. What's do, what we're doing to us is happening now. We're the ones that are offending now. All right? Don't identify with the feelings. See them from the third person. I can't talk about that enough. I call it the fly on the wall syndrome. It's almost as, as if I'm a fly on the wall and I'm watching an, the interaction happen with somebody else. I learned this from flying <clears throat> because... One of the things they do is they stick you in a simulator, and as you're going through the simulator, we call it dial of death. They throw all these things, engine failures and fires and all these different kinds of emergencies, and you have to handle them as you go through. Well, a few minutes in the simulator, the whole thing's hydraulic and it's moving, and after a few minutes, you don't realize you're in a simulator. You kind of forget that you're in a machine, and you're actually feeling like you're flying because you have all, all this computer screens and everything. You actually are, in your mind's eye, in an airplane, and all this stuff starts to happen. And one thing that the passengers really don't like is, uh, let's say the engine catches on fire. They don't want the pilot to go, oh, my God, the engine's on fire. <laughs> you know? So very quickly you have to learn to compartmentalize. You know? So the first time you, the, the light goes off and the, and the handle and the, the bell's ringing in your ear and you're going, oh, my gosh. The first time you see that, you're like, wow, that's shocking. But very quickly you kind of go, oh, engine fire. Engine fire checklist. And you just, it's as if it's happened to somebody else. Third person, you just almost come out of your body. It's like having an out-of-body experience. And then you're not, the emotions aren't controlling you. And that, if you're not being in control of your emotions, then you're not going to make the emotional mistakes. You can think clearly. So for me, it's like it's happening in a third person. Very often I'll wake up and I'll, if I don't say my prayers right away, my wife will say something to me and I can just feel like it's, I'm starting to have this argument with her and I'll realize it. And I'll go in my mind's eye to the third person and go, wow, Dave's having a rough day today. I talk to myself in the third person. You know, well, he's going to get through this. This too shall pass. I used to think this too shall pass was one of the cliches of AA that was so stupid. Now I understand that this too shall pass is one of the most spiritual sayings we have in the rooms because it means it's temporary. Life is change. You know, my problem is my resistance to the change. If I just stop fighting and go with the stream of life, Everything takes care of itself. It's just a matter of time. And has anybody ever gone through something really bad in their life? When you come out the backside, don't you look back on it and go, man, I'm a better human being. I'm a better man because I went through that. Not when you're in the middle of the hellfire, but when you come out. I mean, if you think about it, you know, it's almost like, it's almost like we're raw coal, you know, and God takes us and he sticks us into the fire gets hotter than hell, and he takes us out of the fire, and he throws us up on his anvil, and he starts beating the hell out of us with the hammer, and he douses us in water, and then he sticks us right back in the fire, you know, gets us hot again, throws us on the anvil, beat us. But before you know it, what did he make? He made a sword, right? We become a spiritual warrior and implement the change as we go forth in life. But it takes that process of uncomfortability and getting the hell beat out of us until we're sharp as steel. Right? <clears throat> Without any expectations of restorative justice. That means you don't get to decide whether they have to pay the penalty or not. We're looking for mercy for us. We have to offer mercy to them. All right? Grace and forgiveness. That they go hand in hand. All right? <clears throat> Write out the 12-part prayer. Watch the ego lose its emotional charge and be happy. Until you've tried this, don't judge it. Once you've tried it and you've felt the power of the experience, it'll be mind-blowing for you. You'll go, how did I ever get through an inventory without doing this? All right? We ask God's forgiveness and require what corrective measures should be taken. That's part of the prayer that we're doing every single day on 86. It comes right after the 12 questions we're supposed to do on our daily inventory. It's right there. But most of us don't even realize what we're asking. We're asking for God's grace and His forgiveness. The corrective action is when I get one of those things, I write out a 12-part prayer. If I've got some unforgiveness towards somebody, I'll do that as part of my, in my review. Here's one of the things I'll tell you also. We're going to cover it in one of the later sessions. We talk about prayer and meditation. If you look at the big book, the way it's written, it says when we retire at night. The original multilith didn't say that. The original multilith said when we awake in the morning, we look back over the day past. Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob did not do the evening review like it's described in our big book. If you read our history books, Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timer and Pass It On, both in both of those books they describe how they'd get up in the morning and they do this this re reflection. Because I don't know about you, but when I get to the end of the day, I'm tired, and it's real easy for me to lie to me. Nobody lies to me better than me. And so if I've offended Ralph, I'd be like, eh, Ralph's okay, I'm good with that. you know. But the next morning, when I've had a fresh night of sleep and I'm not tired, and I look at that, I go, oh, 
I hurt Ralph yesterday. Let me go, go, go clean it up with Ralph. Does that make sense? <clears throat> All right. Why do we do this? Believe it or not, forgiveness is pleasurable. It feels good. If you've ever gotten forgiveness, somebody has forgiven you, you feel like a weight's been lifted. It's also, if you've been carrying around this ball and chain because you've been hating somebody and you let go of it, it may not feel pleasurable right that specific second, but within a few days, few minutes, few hours, all of a sudden you realize, wow, life's a little bit lighter. You're feeling pretty good. You're, just, you're, not, life, you're wearing life like a loose garment. It's two quarter books, right? <clears throat> Lord's Prayer. We say it at almost every single meeting, right? Get, forgive us as we forgive others. It's like the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Here's one of my favorite expressions. You can never give away as much as you get by giving it away. You know, you're always the receiver, even when you're giving. You know, if in, from Christian circles, they, you know, Jesus had that parable where he says, you know, if you're going to do something, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's up to. That's what he was talking about. Because otherwise, we'll start doing it for the good feeling. We'll start artificially helping other people because we're getting an emotional charge off it, and that's not the purpose of it. You know, the best kind of, of forgiveness and the best kind of help is when we do it, we don't even realize we've done something good for somebody else. All right? Forgiveness breaks the psychic chains. It's those chains that we have to that harm are stronger than steel. They're some of the toughest things in the world. <clears throat> Unforgiveness keeps us in the shadows of our ego. Forgiving brings us into the sunlight of the Spirit, like we talked about. Notice that last little sentence up there? How free do you want to be? My good friend Mark Houston, who's deceased now, he's in the big meeting in the sky, used to say that all the time. If I called him up with something and I was kind of bitching and moaning to him, he'd say, well, have you written it out? Have you written a gratitude list? Have you done this? Have you done that? And he'd go through this whole thing and then he'd say, how free do you want to be, Dave? And I'd be like, oh, go screw Mark. <laughs> but he was right and I knew he was right. And he knew that I was going to go do what he told me to do. You know, Forgiveness allows us to love again. That's the real key. Forgiveness puts a shell over our heart and it blocks us off. One of the best ways to connect with God, you've heard the expression, God is love. Well, if you're blocked off from God, guess what you're blocked off from? Blocked off from love. That means the love that's supposed to come to you. So you're choosing emotional pain rather than emotional joy. Who wants to make that decision? Only somebody that's emotionally sick. Uh, here's the one that I throw up there because a lot of alcoholics have this. We, we have self-hatred. And I've heard this dozens and dozens of times. Well, God can't love me because I did fill in the blank, whatever it is. That's spiritual pride, you know. There is nobody has done anything in this world is sunk too low that God can't forgive it. I have never seen it. And I've worked with some... I worked with a guy once that when he was, he was using multiple substances and alcohol, but he was a male nurse. He did, when he was high, he'd go and inject stuff into people's IVs just to see what happened. He killed a bunch of people. And he, he was one of the guys that was, came to me with his crap. And I said, no, you can get free of that. God can, can forgive that. He went on, cleaned it up, went on to become a minister. Changed lots of people's lives because of his past. Hatred destroys the hater, right? Have you ever heard the expression, it's like, you know, you drink an acid hoping the other person's going to die? It doesn't work that way. <clears throat> it destroys you. Acid destroys the container that holds it. And we're talking about emotional acid, right? I love this quote from Dag Hammarskjöld. He was a uh, guy from the UN, an ambassador, you know, forgiveness is the answer to the child's dream of a miracle by which what is broken is made whole again. What is soiled is again made clean. You know, when we forgive, we're the one that gets clean. We're the one that gets free. We're the one that gets made whole. All right? Healing process. It isn't just an act of God. It's a par partnership between us and God. This is a deal. Hang on a second. We've got a question. I'm from the floor. Here. Um, I want to know how you know that God forgave that guy for killing them people like that. Because he was completely and totally ineffective to make a difference in life up until the point that he got free of it. And then he went out and he changed thousands of people's lives for the better. Only God has the power in my mind to do that. Take something that negative and turn it into something so beautifully positive. You know, if you look at the people that... Uh, um, ever heard of Corey Ten Boom? She was an evangelist. She was a Holocaust survivor, you know. The, the people, there's a great book, uh, Weekends with Maury. If you've never read that, I would, it's a phenomenal book, right? People that have been through terrible traumas, POWs, you know, they'll talk about how, 
these terrible, horrendous things happened, and they didn't let it get them down. They forgave because they had to because it was going to destroy them if they didn't. And then you watch their actions, and they go out, and they make a difference in the world, and they change thousands of people's lives. To me, that's God with skin. Only God has the power to be able to do that kind of good with something that was that bad. <clears throat> Only God <clears throat> does the healing power with our cooperation. We have free will. And until you want to get better, you're not going to get better. God's not going to step into your life and change you without your permission. It's just how he rolls. At least that's my experience with it. You've got to give him permission to come in there and take care of it, whatever it is. The key is you don't get a vote. What I want doesn't matter, right? Remember that from yesterday? <clears throat> it's our responsible to do what's necessary to get healed. If we don't change, the wounds become who we are. It assumes our identity and we become frozen in time. Here's one of the things that I've learned. Most men, virtually every man, I don't think I, I know a man that doesn't carry an emotional wound. Wherever that emo- wound occurred, you get kind of frozen in time. If you start working with some of the guys you work with, especially people like that, that lost their dad at a young age, you know, they were 10, 15, 17, and their dad died. When you will start working with them, one of the things you'll notice is they're frozen emotionally like a 17-year-old because that was the wound, and they've identified from that point forward, and they felt lost from that time forward because they didn't really have anybody to, to show them the way. You know, that was true in my case. I started using drugs and alcohol at, at 13, you know. I was frozen in an emotional age of 13, and we hear that in the rooms. You know, when I got, started drinking, I was, I, I was, you know, 45 years old, but I had the emotional of whatever age they started drinking. Most of us started drinking because we were wounded, you know, and we're f- emotionally frozen in time until we heal that wound, and then all of a sudden we can start catching up. <clears throat> if you'll do what you can do, he'll do what you can't do. God does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. We hear it all the time. That's what they're talking about. <clears throat> it starts with being sick and tired of being sick and tired. One of my favorite expressions is the gift of desperation. Until you have the gift of desperation, nothing changes. You know, That's one of the reasons why, you know, used to say in AA, um, the, the only requirement of membership is an honest desire. In my experience, one of the reasons our recovery rates have dropped so much is we have dozens and dozens of people in AA who don't want to be there. They're getting a nudge from the judge. Their wife tells them they're going to leave them if they don't come into Alcoholics Anonymous. They, they don't have the gift of desperation. So they're just coming to, for some ulterior motive, sitting in an AA meeting. Therefore, they don't have the motive, motivation to go through the steps to change. And that's why AA becomes a dumping ground. And they just go in, they dump their problems, and it becomes a group therapy session, and, and they don't ever change, you know, year after year after year. And AA becomes a revolving door. They don't stay. They go around. They keep going in and out, in and out, in and out, until one time they'll go out and they hurt really bad. And then you'll see them come in. I have a, a guy that I sponsor, Clayton, phenomenal guy, biker, tatted all up, rides a Harley. He's a mechanic, bald head. He came to the, the home group. Our home group now has a safe in it because when he was, went back out, he'd break in and steal the money out of the safe. He'd take a hanger and, you know, so now they have a big heavy-duty lockdown safe, you know. He used to drive by the meeting and throw beer bottles out the window at the guy standing outside smoking cigarettes, you know. He didn't have the gift of desperation. You talk to Clayton today, that man has got the gift of desperation, right? When he finally came back in, he crawled in on his hands and knees and said, please, guys, forgive me and help me. And now he's a solid, rock-solid guy in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. This guy would give you, he's a big teddy bear, he'd give you the shirt off his back and be happy to do it. <clears throat> right? <clears throat> Healing is an event, it's a lifestyle. Right? Uh, page 8, colon 2. A way of life that is incredibly more wonderful as time passes. If you're sitting in this room and you've got 60 days, a year, two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, and your life just feels like somebody pissed in your Wheaties, and you're just like, man, life sucks. You know, you're like Charlie Brown with a cloud over your head, and just you've missed something. This program should set you free. The whole purpose of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, if you read our 12th step, there's one goal. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result, not a result, one result. We do this to wake up our spirit, to be happy, joyous, and free. If you're not living life like that, Hello, warning flag, you've missed something. Grab somebody, have them take you through this work, and you can get back to happy, joyous, and free. I don't care what your circumstances are. You heard my story yesterday. I'm happy, joyous, and free. You know, I've lost my health, my career, my retirement. I'm the luckiest man alive, you know, because I'm walking with God. How did I get off on that tangent? Ah, where was I? 
Uh, we already talked about hurt freezes us in the stage of life. Number four, God doesn't want us just to be healed. He wants to help you change the way you live. AA is not something that I do. It is a way of life. If, if AA is just going to a meeting once a day, that's not Alcoholics Anonymous. That's something you do. AA, it says over and over and over in our literature, AA is a way of life. It's got to become part of your fiber and your being and, and your existing Right? Healing isn't focused on removing our pain. It's focused on redeeming God's purpose for our lives. We don't do this so that we feel better. We don't forgive so we can get rid of the emotional bond. We get rid of the re- resentment and we forgive so that we're not blocked from God and we can then allow God to work through us, that we can be his representative. It's the second part of the decision from the third step that we covered yesterday. All right? Um, <clears throat> Healing isn't focused on removing the pain. I just did that one. Healing removes that which blocks us from our true nature and effectiveness for God. All right? This is one of the things that I wanted to talk about with you guys. Inner vows, self-promises. I made an inner vow at the age of 13. I said I will never, ever be like my son of a bitch father. Guess what I turned out just like? <laughs> you know? I smoked the, smoked the same kind of cigarettes. I drank the same way. You know? When I, before I got in the rooms and even for a few years after I got in the rooms, I didn't care if she was your wife. I'd bang her and then move on. You know, I did all the classic behavior that I learned from my earthly father. You know, the God that I have today, I don't do any of that stuff anymore. But the reason I was doing it was because I had made a vow. Anytime you make a vow in your life and say, I will never, your ego is permanently in control of that area. And God will never come into that area. And trust me, you will be screwed up till the cows come home in that area. All right? There it is. I'll never do, or I'll never be like. No one will ever do blank to me again. That's a huge one for most men. I will never have anybody get one over on me like that again. Guess what? You spend your entire life like this, looking around going, who's going to do it to me? Who's going to do it to me? People that are even thinking about doing it to you, and you're doing it to them before they can do it to you. All right? <clears throat> A vow means that God can't be king over this area, and it goes against your third step decision. We tend to overreact. Somebody gets anywhere near your inner vow, and watch how short the fuse is. You know, if you're ever doing something, you know, and you're kind of being deceitful, lies of omission, and you know, and your wife certain starts to notice around about it, and man, look at the cut ton of dynamite that goes off. What do you mean? I'm not being dishonest, man. You just overreact. It's because there's an inner vow there. You're doing something, and it was more important you to do it than to be honest and be transparent. All right? <clears throat> Makes us unhealthy, a little crazy. I don't know if that's an understatement, pretty much. All right? <clears throat> no one can influence us anymore. Not a sponsor or a spiritual advisor. You've taken control of that area of your life. All right? Touchy, vulnerable, explosive. Breaking inner vows by admitting them and writing them down. That's the process. It just goes par, par and par, parcel to this. All right? It causes, uh, forgive the causer by bringing the vow to God. Whatever your vow was based off of, that's what you need to forgive. That's the key to this deal. So if somebody got one over you and that's why you're never going to allow anybody to get one over you, whoever got one over on you, you got to take that person, put them in column one, do the forgiveness prayer, get to your side of the street, free yourself from it. That's the process. Forgiveness is pleasurable. Don't ever forget that. And it allows you to love again. With it comes the gifts of being in the sunlight of the Spirit. I mean, how cool is that? Happiness, peace, love, and a sense of direction are the fruits of forgiveness. Once again, I'll ask you, how free do you want to be? It breaks the psychic change, and it comes from awareness. As long as you're walking through life asleep, you'll never stumble across this. Once you go on a fear hunt and you start looking through your life, through the inventory process, you'll start to discover this stuff. And it's unbelievably insidious. That's the reason I do inventory every January and every June. Formally, I grab another alcoholic and say, hey, let's go through the work together. And we sit down and we write formally a first step, second step, third step, fourth step, right through the process. Because I know from experience, I miss stuff on 10 and 11. And it slips through the filter. And when I go through on this process, I discover stuff and it's like, wow, how did I forget that? Anybody in here that's got multiple years of sobriety ever remember something that horrendous? And you're like, wow, I've done six or seven inventories, and that never came up, and all of a sudden something floats to the surface, and you're like, how did I forget that? You know, I had one of those, well, I guess it was about a year ago, I was doing inventory, and I think I called JR and said, hey, man, this thing just floated to the surface, and I don't know how I missed it. A huge harm. But if you're a blackout drinker, 
I guarantee you there's stuff out there you can't remember. It's like peeling an onion. Eventually, when you're ready to be able to deal with it, God will float it to the surface so you can deal with it. And guess what? You'll be back on the anvil and he'll be honing the the steel a little bit harder. Never identify with the negative feelings. That's part of the problem. You know, that woman that I used as an example who had been raped, her identity was attached to the rape. You know, when you would talk to her about it, when she would be vulnerable and, and let people in on that, uh, into her wall that she keeps everybody out of, she would describe herself as a, as a rape victim. She was a rape victim. She's not now, but her identity was attached to it the same way that my identity was attached to being a pilot. Being a pilot is not me. That's something I do or did. I am completely different. <clears throat> Bear with me. Those of you who are against religion, follow this story. It's extremely important. Ozzy was one of the guy, he and his wife bought the Wilson house up in Vermont where Bill Wilson grew up as a kid. And they turned it into a 50C3 corporation, nonprofit, and it is now run by alcoholics. People volunteer their vacations and go up to East Dorset, Vermont. I've done a number of workshops up there. AAs show up and we've renovated the place and put it up where there's one of the greatest archives that you'll ever see. It's it's getting pretty close to being better than the one in New York City, the one that they won't let us into anymore. All the old timers as they pass are leaving their stuff to the to the Wilson house. Ozzy used his retirement to buy the place. And one of the things that he would always do before he passed, when there was a workshop out there like this, he would come in and tell this parable. I never really understood it. It's from two places, Matthew and Luke. Matthew makes the most sense to me, anyway. It says, now when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, what have we been talking about? Doing a four-step inventory, right? We go in and we clean the inside of the cup, as it says, right? We're going into our heart and cleaning out the stuff that's been blocking us off from God. So the unclean spirit, it passes through the desert. In other words, we're not drinking anymore. We've done our inventory and we're sober. We're in recovery, right? It goes through the waters places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it unoccupied. If you clean out your heart and you don't fill it with God and you're not helping others and you're not making the world a better place, you've created a void in your life. That void will be filled. And here's what it gets filled with. It takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. I guarantee you've seen it in recovery. I've lived it in recovery, and trust me, it is not pleasant. What are the seven spirits? Take your choice, boys and girls. These are just some of the spirits that come in there. You watch. Guys will get sober, and then all of a sudden, boom, they're off doing porno. They're hiring hookers. They're cheating on their wife. They're cheating at work. They're cheating on their taxes. They're gambling. They're spending money they don't have, racking up credit card debt, you know, just so they can go bankrupt and get one over on somebody. Like, it's free money, you know. Uh, Anger, rage. Mm, There's no angry people in AA, is there? Negativity, bigotry, abuse. I cannot overemphasize number 15, abuse. I know more people in recovery that when you talk to them across a cup of coffee or at an AA meeting, they are AA angels but they're at-home devils. You talk to their families, and they're rageaholics. They run with a thumb over the top of their family. They're still terrorizing them, and they're just raging everywhere. And they wonder why they wear their sponsor out, because they always have a problem. They can't ever seem to get to it, because they're filled with unclean spirits. They've just traded addictions. <clears throat> All right? And 16, I don't have ever met anybody that has 16. Control, perfectionism. Manipulation, aggression, dishonesty, gossip. Nobody that I've ever seen. <clears throat> that I see every morning when I look in the mirror. You know? Here's the, here's the last thing. I think that's the last thing. Yes. Here's the last thing I want to leave you with. <clears throat> By the way, this list is in your guide someplace. And it's page 12 in the guide. <clears throat> the last thing I want to leave you with is It's human. We fall into this stuff. Our ego will, it's insidious. It will trap us. It will get one over on us. It will sneak up on you when you least expect it. You can almost plan on it. When it does, you don't wig out about it. 
you go through the process and you clean the stuff up. We've got 12 steps that work wonderfully well to do that. You know, the expression that I love is even the monkey falls out of the tree once in a while. You know, <clears throat> I did it this morning. I thought I had finished this PowerPoint. I hadn't. I just put the title on, hit enter. That was as far as I got. So I skipped breakfast in order to put this together because even the monkey falls out of the tree once in a while. And my perfectionism went, oh, shit, I just I can't have him reading out of the guide. I got to put something up on the screen. You know, it would have been good either way. You know, but in my mind, I'm going to control it. Do I beat myself up over it? No, because that will block me off from God. God, thank you. I managed to get breakfast in. I just got it late. I ate with the other group of people, you know, and I still got here. So we've talked about three or four columns. The last column on the fourth step from the resentment inventory is where was I selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened? All right? Kind of an important little piece there. All right? Where was I selfish is really your third step issue. It's where you've been trying to control, where you're trying to get your way. Right? I want something is typically the way I tell guys to answer the selfish piece. Yeah. I gave you definitions in there, uh, the sheet before the uh, short, short form of inventory. There's some definitions there. You'll see them about selfishness, dishonesty, self-seeking, and afraid. The seeking, the self-seeking, almost every piece of self-seeking is triggered by a fear. If you can catch what you were seeking, you'll f- uncover your fears. And I'll explain what that, what that looks like. Uh, the dishonesty piece, I guarantee you, you're always lying to three people. Number one, who do we lie to better than anybody in the entire world? Ourselves. Who else are we lying to? God. If you took a third step, you've turned your will, that means what you want, in every area of your life over to him. That means you don't get a vote. Well, if you're seeking something, you were trying to get a vote. All right? So we're lying to God. And who else are we lying to? The other person that, you, that you're resentful at. Because you weren't presenting them to you. You were looking for something from them. You didn't go to them and say, you know, I'm seeking this, 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 and this, and then you hurt me? No. You were in the, in the relationship falsely expecting something, and when you didn't get what you expected, then you got resentful. You know, you got what you ordered. An expectation is a reservation for a resentment. We've all heard that in rooms, right? <clears throat> uh, and then fear. When we finish the fears, we take those across and we transfer them over onto the fear inventory. Right? And we've got a sheet for that. You'll notice on that, that fear sheet that I've put in there, it's got one piece of Dave on it. <clears throat> Column one of the fear inventory says the fears. We list them down, right? Take them right off your four-step resentment inventory and just list them. Boom, boom, boom. <clears throat> and you'll note it's in the guide. It's page 36. All right. In the big book, we're on page 68, colon 1 for the fear inventory. All right. We now have all the fears from column 4, question 4 from our resentment, right? From the resentment inventory. Where was I frightened? Those are all the fears we've uncovered that are connected to resentment. What does it say in the book on page 68, 1? It says, we reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper, comma, even though we had no resentment in connection with them. The reason why we put fears that are not connected to resentment, because we've already got all the fears that are connected to resentment. We got that from the resentment inventory. Now you just have to look for any other fears that you might have. Fear of heights, fear of spiders, fear of being gay, fear of whatever, fear of motorcycles, fear of clowns. I mean, I've heard all kinds of crazy fears that people have. You know, we list them down. <clears throat> yes? Before you started listing, listing the spiders and stuff, you had said something and I didn't... <clears throat> quite catch what you had said before what you said started. What I said was, we already have the fears connected to resentment. They're in column four, question four. Right. So the instruction is, list any fears that are not connected to resentment, because we've already done that work. And we're not duplicating work here, all right? <clears throat> so we've got the fears connected to resentment. Now we look through our lives, and you, just, you do that by meditation. You just sit there and say, okay, God, show me. And something pops into your head, you write it down, all right? One of the things that I learned, and it's a personal technique, you don't have to follow it, you've got that second column there that says opposite fear. One of the things I was afraid of was not being loved, <clears throat> right? And all of a sudden it occurred to me, you know what? I'm also afraid of its opposite. I'm afraid of being loved because what happens if they leave? I'll be abandoned. Oh, I'm afraid of being abandoned. See how it leads to other fears you don't even realize you've got? The goal is we're on a fear hunt. Why are we on a fear hunt? Because every single character defect 
And let me say that again. Every single character defect is connected to fear. I have not seen any defect that we do as human beings that's not driven by fear. We're driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, self-pity, right? As it says in the book. <clears throat> I don't want to do character defects anymore. The way you don't do character defects is you find the fear and you kill them using the fear tool from page 68. All right? <clears throat> Make sense? Why am I afraid? Well, let's see what the book says. We asked ourselves why we had them right out of the book. So by asking ourselves, why am I afraid of spiders? You'll be able to lead yourself through. I call it a boiling down process. And as you boil them down, we're trying to get down to the lowest. I use the analogy of a, of a tree. <clears throat> a tree's got 10,000 leaves on it. They're all 10,000 different variations of fear. If I cut off one branch, I might kill 500 leaves by cutting off that one branch. So I got leaf fears and I got branch fears. But if I kill the roots, I kill the entire tree and all 10,000 fears. So the boiling down process, and we ask ourselves why we had them, is to get down to the root, right? So, <clears throat> for example, you know, you can pick a, give me a fear. Who's got a fear? Financial insecurity. Why am I afraid of financial insecurity? It can be a root fear for some people, but for other people it's because if I don't have money, then I can't pay my mortgage. If I can't pay my mortgage, my family, we're concerned about the money because we want to be able to provide for our family. So the real root fear in that scenario would be those I love being hurt. See? So in that scenario that we just did, the financial insecurity is a branch fear, not the root fear. And it might start with, if I don't get my new job or the new new promotion or the, this whatever it is, that's the leaf fear. Then you get to the branch, then you get to the root. See how the process works? I call the root the hit parade because it comes up over and it's like the top 40. You know, and every six months when I go through the formal process, I might have, well, I put them on a card and um, I always print them out and put them on a card that I carry with me. Here it is. Here's my fear card. This time I've got uh, 18 hit parade fears. The one through about eight fears, those are the ones that will be kicking my butt right now. When I do my inventory six months from now, those will drop to like the 16, 17, 18 fears. And the ones that were at the bottom of the list will have moved to the top because your ego will always attack you from different angles. If you put up a block, it'll figure out a way around to try to hit you from the flank, right? <clears throat> so that's the fear inventory. I call them hit parade or root fears. That's the, that's the fear sheet. Sex inventory, right out of the book. Yes, sir. John, alcoholic. Hey, John. Uh, you said that uh, the fear killer is a process. Yes. Why would those fears keep coming up for you? Ego. The ego, it uses fear as a tool, right? Your ego is in your mind, right? We've already determined the, the problem centers in our mind, okay? What tool does your mind have to control you? It's got to keep you out of the present moment because the present moment is where you find God. And it does that by doing the past-future dance. It goes into the past from something that happened to you, and it projects what you think is probably going to happen in the future, Right? And when it does that, it skipped right over the present moment. And then it goes back into your experience from the past and gets another thing that was bad that happened to you. We don't normally spend a whole lot of time obsessing on the great things that happened in the past and they're going to happen in the future, other than maybe getting laid uh, for guys. You know, we think, wow, that was awesome and I'm going to see her again tonight. Either way, we're not in the present moment. Most of the time, for alcoholics, most of the time for alcoholics, we're in the past thinking something negative and we're projecting in the future. And our ego does that back and forth. And it uses fear. Really, your ego is a one-trick pony. It only has one tool, fear. All right? And let me re regress again. Let me go back to one of my favorite stories. And I'm not saying this to offend anybody, but if you go back to the Christian biblical story of Genesis, right? God creates the heaven and the earth. He creates the, the garden. He makes Adam and Eve. Everything's going peachy keen, right? All of a sudden, they eat the apple. What happens when they eat the apple? They ate the apple of the tree of knowledge. Where does the problem reside? Knowledge of good. God is good, right? They already knew God before they ate the apple. So they already had knowledge of good, but they didn't have the knowledge of evil. Ego. All right? The moment they bit the apple, what was their first reaction? <gasps> I'm naked. They're ashamed. What causes shame? Fear. It lit up the ego. What do they do? They run into the bushes. They sow some fig leaves. Here comes God coming through through the garden. Hey, where are you guys? Right? We're hiding. Why are you hiding from me? We were naked 
and ashamed. And the next line in that story is, who told you you were naked? I used to think it was the snake. It wasn't the snake. It was their ego. The ego told them they were naked. That's where the shame come, came from. All right? If you follow that tradition, <laughs> we got one happy person. If you follow that tradi- the Christian tradition, it makes perfect sense. It fits right with our alcoholic experience. Our ego lies to us with fear and we react. We're like little marionette puppets, you know? Trigger a fear, watch me react, you know? Oh, you, your wife comes in and she says, you son of a bitch, I'm leaving you. Watch me react, <laughs> you know? My buddy Mark would say, I love you, go in peace. That's the correct response. Not very many of, us, many of us are that spiritually centered in the present moment to be able to say, okay, honey, go in peace. That's usually not our first reaction. Maybe our second or third, you know. Does that make sense? All right. Great segue, talking about Adam and Eve, we'll go into the sex inventory. The book, it's another written inventory. The book gives us nine questions. The sex inventory is in your, uh, on page 34 of the guide. <clears throat> All right? Comes from page 69. If you can't remember sex, you should be able to remember that number. Uh, so, and whatever you do, don't get page 96. <laughs> Go read 96 and thinking about sex, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so I got a couple questions here at the very top. Those questions are Dave's experience. They're not out of the book, and you'll notice they're not out of the book. Everywhere that's out of the book, like the the nine questions in a row, I tell you where the questions come from. Who is the relationship with? Right? It's great to have the identification of who we're talking about. I put all one-night stands into one group because I couldn't remember who the hell they were. You know, I was a whore. I I was after one thing, my pleasure. That was it. So I grouped them all into one because they I, they were all the exact same. Every one of the one-night stands I had. All right. <clears throat> How did you meet? Every long-term relationship I've had in recovery. And in my addiction, it was love at first sight. I literally, my wife, I was unpacking my, my car at college. I walked, was walking through up to go up to my dorm room. I saw two girls walking across the parking lot. I was a senior. I knew every girl in, in college on that campus. I said, ah, oh, fresh meat. That was the first thought that went through my mind. Literally, that exact expression, fresh meat. And I, this brunette, I saw her, and I, as I walked by, I said, hey. And she smiled. I went upstairs, and I am unpacking my box, and my roommate comes walking, and I said, Fritz, I just saw the woman I'm going to marry. Didn't know her name. That's how alcoholics do it. <laughs> Ever been sitting in an A meeting, you see a woman walk through the door, and you're watching her, and you're like, man, oh, she's awesome. Can't wait to ask her out. I don't care that she's married. And she gets her cup of coffee, and by the time she gets to go get her seat, you've married her, you've got kids, and you've divorced the bitch because she cheated on you. <laughs> you don't even know her name, you know? Maybe I'm the only one, but that's how my mind works when I'm really not, not healthy. <laughs> All right. So uh, we, we look at the, uh, we, we look at where, how we met. How long did you start to date before you had sex? Important question. What was your relationship based off of? Was it based off of pleasure? Was it based off of sex? Or was it based off of having things in common? We'll talk more about that. I'm going to do a session I call Relationship 101. Because one of the things you'll learn in Alcoholics Anonymous is the rooms are filled with people that don't know how to have relationships. Guys are married three, four, five, six times, dysfunctional relationship after dysfunctional relationship. If you come to AA and you ask about how to have a relationship, you will learn how to have a dysfunctional relationship. If you want to learn how to have a healthy relationship, your odds are a thousand percent better by going to Al-Anon, and they'll tell you about how to have a dysfunctional relationship. And you'll be dealing with women who really want to orbit and do everything that you want to do anyway. So you've got a better chance. All right. Uh, But I digress. (laughs) What were some of the good things about the relationship and what were some of the bad things about the relationship? The reason I asked those two questions, good things about the relationship, you've already paid the price of a nasty relationship. It may have ended up in a divorce. It may have cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars and a lot of emotional pain. Let's learn from it. You've already paid the check. So if there was something good about that relationship, like having things in common, that transitions straight across onto a sex ideal. Some of the bad things in common, on my ideal, it was I had always jumped into bed on the first possible chance. So my ideal, I reversed it. Someone with whom I won't have sex right away. 
will, st will found a relationship on something other than sex. Let's learn from the dysfunctional relationships we've already had. Then there's the nine questions, and we answer the questions. At the end of each of the questions, I have a little indicator as to why, depending on our answers, what it is. If it's a harm, guess what? When we go to make our amends, one of the first things you need to know when you're going to make amends is what harm you caused. I have guys all the time that come to me and they say, oh, I know, I need to go make an amend to this person. The first question out of my mouth is, why? Half the time they can't tell me why they need to go make amends. They're feeling some guilt inside, something's not quite right, but they can't specifically say, I did this, 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 and this. I'll help you out by answering it on these. If you've answered these questions, if it says harm at the end, guess what? That's what you're going to be making amends for. All right? Does that make sense? All right. So we have the sex inventory. When we're done with the sex inventory, we take the information off that inventory and we turn it into an ideal. We look at the negative stuff and turn it into positive. Then we add two things to our ideal. Number one thing we add is what do you want from a relationship? Well, that's going to be completely selfish. You need to go to God and say, God... When you give me a partner and a healthy partner, what is it that I should be looking for in a relationship? And anything that comes to you goes on to your ideal. You have to assume that it came from God. Don't do what my sponsee Kevin did one day, walk in with a penthouse picture and throw it on the desk and go, there's my ideal. <laughs> Not going to cut it. I said, what, the airbrush? <clears throat> <clears throat> the second thing that goes on your ideal, and this is the most important thing from my experience, uh, and I'm coming up on 24 years of marriage, is what do you need to be bringing to the relationship? Right? That's crucial. And here's what I do. You want to go for advanced sobriety, hardcore? If you got some real good quinones, halfway between my inventories, I do inventory January and June, in the middle of those inventories, I take the ideal that I've written, and I give it to my wife and use it as a report card. I say, honey, how am I doing on this? I do the same thing with my kids, not with the sex ideal, but I go to my kids and I say, hey guys, how am I doing as your dad? You want to live transparently? You want to find out how, what effect you're having in sobriety, emotional sobriety? Go do that with your family. Do not attempt that, just like they put that you know, on the TV screen, do not attempt this at home. Do not even consider attempting that maneuver until you've been through the work with your sponsor and you've, you're spiritually centered with God. Because let me tell you, it's excruciatingly painful. Uh, about a year ago, I did that with my wife, and she looked at me. What came out of her mouth was, in the last year, you hurt me more than you've ever hurt me in your entire life. That is tough. I've spent the last year Focusing on how to be a better husband. And I mean studying on almost a daily basis on how to be a better husband. And our marriage is better than it's ever been. We're talking hardcore stuff, but I wouldn't trade it for the world because I'm not hurting that woman that I love dearly anymore. Big boy school. This is tough stuff. And I'm not by no means am I talking down from the spiritual hilltop. The monkey falls out of the tree regularly in this arena. It's one of the toughest areas in my life is being honest and open with my wife because I'm so scarred in that arena. Very, very tough stuff. How much? How am I doing on time? <clears throat> Five? Okay, good. Whew, breath. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Last thing I want you to look at, page 70. <clears throat> All right, 70 colon... What is it? 70 colon 3. <clears throat> One of the great, great paragraphs that almost nobody takes a look at. It says, if we've been thorough about our personal inventory, we have written down a lot. Yeah, we've done a four-step inventory, short forms, for all these people that we've hired. We've done a, a, a fear inventory. We've done a sex inventory. We've written a sex ideal. You're going to have 10, 12 pages of writing. It's going to take some time to do this. All right, we've written down a lot. There's a question. I call these Q statements. Anytime the big book makes a statement like that, I put a little Q at the end of it to ask the question, have I written down a lot? If it's on a three-by-five card, eh, let's try this again. We have listed and analyzed our resentments. Q question, have you? We have begun to comprehend their futility and 
their fatality. It's a conditional statement. We know the futility of continuing resentments, but a lot of us don't realize that we may drink again if we don't clean this crap up. How many times have you been in a meeting and people would absolutely announce to the group, I call it spiritual dumping ground, you know, I'm so pissed off at my boss, I got a resentment. And the next week they're back and they share the exact same thing. They don't understand the fatality. They're, they're playing with a cobra and when it bites them, they're going to go, well, I didn't know it could bite me. It's a cobra, dummy. You know, that's the way we are. Um, we've begun to learn tolerance. Have you? Patience. Have you? And goodwill toward all men. That includes the people, the sons of bitches that were in column one of your resentment inventory. <laughs> Even our enemies, for we look at them as sick people. And here's where the last inventory comes from. We have listed the people we have hurt by our conduct. This is the harms done to the other air inventory. If there's a hurt that you've conducted, that you're conscious of, and it didn't fit in one of those other inventories, that's the catch-all phrase. That's the fifth inventory. you know. And so you list them all down there. That is your eighth step, guys. You've done everything in the fourth step to finish the rest of the steps. It's already done. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Do I have three more? Okay. Then we go on to the fifth step. One of the things that I'll tell you is do not open this Pandora's box and sit on the inventory. All right? Do not be like at least two dozen guys that I've worked with in the last year that have written their inventory, especially their sex inventory, and left it around for their wife to find it. <laughs> if you need to, type it into Microsoft Word and you can put a security on it so they can be locked. You know, I even had one guy who put it in his gym bag, put his gym bag under the spare tire in the trunk of his car. His wife saw him hiding something under the tire in the trunk of the car. Where do you think she's going? <laughs> you know, they're in the process of getting a divorce. Not, not a happy thing. You do not want your wife to find your inventory. All right. You choose somebody who's going to hear your fifth step. You don't want somebody that doesn't have experience. All right, there's a whole list of, of items in the, in the guide of, of the, what the book tells us to who's supposed to hear our inventory. We go to them. The first part of an inventory is we explain to whoever it is why we're there, that we are on a life and death errand because we understand the futility and the fatality. That's why I asked you that cue question. So I go to you and I say, hey, would you hear my inventory? If I don't finish this stuff, I know I'm going to die. Would you help me through the spiritual process? And then we sit down and we're prepared for a long talk. We're going to go over the sheets, the information that's there. <clears throat> when we're done with the fifth step, and they've helped me see my side of the street and make sure I wasn't lying to myself or anybody else, we go back and do the quiet hour afterwards. Everybody go to page 75. <clears throat> Last paragraph on page 75. It says, returning home, we find a place where we can be quiet for an hour, carefully reviewing what we have done. We thank God from the bottom of our heart that we know him better. That's a prayer. Taking this book down from the shelf, we turn to the page that contains the 12 steps. That's page 59. And we look at the first five steps. Have we omitted anything? For we're building an arch through which we shall walk a free man at last. Is our work solid so far? Are our stones properly in place? If nobody has shown you the stones, how are you supposed to finish this in your quiet hour? You don't know. So in the guide, and I don't know where it is, somebody will tell me, I give you the construction references. And we're running out of time, so I don't want to waste the, the time. Page 13 of the construction references at the very bottom. It's where the cement is located. It's where the foundation stone, the cornerstone, the keystone. So you can answer that question when you do your quiet hour afterwards. Every one of the forgiveness prayers that you've written out, I have you say in the quiet hour to make sure there's no emotional charge anymore. We don't throw those prayers away. And we're done? Okay. So the last thing, you're going to say that prayer at least three times with me. You're going to say the forgiveness prayer between column three and column four. You're going to say it during the fifth step, quiet hour. And then before you go make amends to that person, if you owe an amend to them, before you go up and knock on their door, you're going to say that forgiveness prayer one more time. Because there's nothing worse than going to make amends and then having to make amends for trying to make amends because you lost your cool. All right. We're out of time.
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.